Funding for All Things Connecticut is made possible by our founding partner, People's United Bank. What Know How Can Do. Welcome to All Things Connecticut. I'm Diane Smith. Join us over the next half hour for stories about people making a difference in our state. We'll visit with some folks who are bringing baseball back to the inner city, meet a woman who is supplying a basic need for babies, and talk with students who are treading lightly on their school campus. But first, big names from Ethel Barrymore to Paul Newman have appeared there. Joanne Woodward helped save it. Now the Westport Country Playhouse has attracted one of the country's great stage directors. Mark Lamos is back in Connecticut and ready to make a difference. I gave out all the firecrackers to all your children early. I said, go ahead, let her rip, make as much noise as you want. Great theater convinces you it's all happening for the very first time. And that illusion, well, it begins here in the rehearsal room, an organic process of give and take between the actors, one that's guided by this director's watchful eyes. You just need to be so instinctively ready for whatever they begin to bring you, that you can work with it or you can find a way to, to ask them to let go of that and find another way. And it's always different each time. I mean, no matter who you work with, you think you have the rules down and they change. For Connecticut's own Mark Lamus, that change this time around goes beyond another set of rehearsals and a brand new production. It's being part of history, 80 years in the making, as he joins the Westport Country Playhouse as its newest artistic director. I so fell in love with the theater itself, the facility, its proximity to my place in New York, its proximity to my place in Connecticut, and the history of the theater itself, which was so amazing to, to just begin to understand. I thought I'd love to be a part of that history. I'd love to take it to the next level. And while he's certainly been there and done that, given his 17 seasons in previously leading Hartford stage, those times have clearly been a changing. It was a different age. You know, there were bigger audiences for nonprofit theater then. There was a lot more funding from the National Endowment, from foundations. To encourage us to do unusual programming, the things I was more passionate about, large classical plays, etc., which filled that space. It's a huge stage, as you recall and given it was just aching to be filled with big flamboyant gestures, all of which I was perfectly happy to provide as a 30-year-old director. <laughs> I have seen the most splendid vision. Today, he can lean on the wisdom of experience at a theater long known for its ability to lure great actors from stage and screen each summer, dating back to the 1930s. His approach to the way he works, the people he works with, the taste he has in the, in the work that he does, the style he has about the work that he does. I always talk about, I, I know when I'm seeing a Mark Lamos production. I wouldn't have to read a program to find that out. You're so in it in a show that he's directed that I, I love that experience. If there's room for the word transformational in Wikipedia's definition of theater, then Mark Lamos should be cross-referenced. He has the ability to take Shakespeare, Shaw, and Steinbeck and turn the poetry of words into remarkably human performances. I don't have your name. Fortunate. <laughs> no, I meant the butler. Pardon? Butler. Well, yes, you, you are the butler, are you not? Butler, my name is Butler. How extraordinary. I so love working with actors. I was an actor for years before I became a director full time. And um, I love the process of, of being in a room with a group of actors. It's just. Uh, Sometimes it can be terrifying, sometimes it can be fraught with problems. Um, it's always, you know, like any family. But it's, it's undeniably exciting to collaborate with really gifted actors. They do things. They feel things. They know what's going on. We don't. We're babies. 
with an extraordinary sense of visual storytelling. Under Lamus's steady hand, the most complex dramas become understandable and relevant. He knows his work. He knows his text. He knows his play. He knows the vision of what it's, you know, he knows the look of what it's going to be about. He plays. He's really, he's willing to work hard at that play to let the sort of, you know, experience happen and shape and work with an actor that way. Successful longtime relationships throughout his career, like this one with Richard Thomas, are further proof of his gift for nurturing the most talented American actors and offering them an artistic home. Help me! Help me! Oh, God! God! Richard Thomas and I did two or three things there that were tremendously challenging, but we just had such a great time working together that the challenges were always like balloons. You'd, you'd blow up and send them off into the sky. Settling into Westport, Lamus's presence has already been felt. It's amazing already how many people are calling on our door and, and saying, I've got this project, I've got that project. You know, and it's often related to, because they know it'll be well taken care of by somebody like Mark Lamos at the helm. If the cultural renaissance Mark Lamus helped lead in Hartford is any indication of the potential for the Playhouse and its future, being instinctive and trusting change might be just the potion to pull up 80 years of theater magic from its deep Connecticut roots. This ephemeral thing you make with people who come together very, very briefly, really, work so hard, open up so much of their inner souls, inner lives to the work, are so vulnerable, all of us, to each other and the play and the, you know, whatever we're doing, and then it vanishes. For Spotlight on the Arts, I'm Ed Wurzbicki. You might call it the bottom line for babies, clean diapers. But for some families in Connecticut, an adequate supply of diapers is a luxury. Thanks to one New Haven woman, kids are pampered now because of an idea that is positively Connecticut. Alexa Vargas is nearly two years old and loves going to Lulac Head Start in New Haven. She comes in here every morning and everyone says she's the happiest baby ever. Alexa's mom, Zuli, is a teacher at the school. We run a circle time, we sing them songs, we read stories, we do art time, we do outside play, we serve them lunch. And every two hours, or more if needed, every baby's diaper is changed. Change the diaper, okay? That may not sound like much to you, but for parents whose budgets are stretched tight, clean diapers can be a luxury. Social worker Joanne Goldblum found out while working with some of New Haven's poorest families. You want to try these? And try to close up. I began to realize that a lot of the families I was working with didn't have things that I thought about as basic needs, and I'd see babies in the same diaper, clearly for a very long time, even for more than one day, and I saw moms taking diapers off and emptying solids out of them and putting them back on the, on the baby, and I started to just think about it and ask questions. Joanne's first question was, why are moms who get financial assistance not able to buy enough diapers? She figures a family with two kids in diapers might spend $100 a month. I sort of thought of food stamps as like just money in the grocery store, and they're not. They're, they're used for very specific food items. Then Joanne started thinking about the implications. Children who cry a lot are at greater risk of abuse. And we also know that children who have diaper rash cry more. Child care centers require an adequate supply of disposable diapers. And so if a parent can't provide that, that child can't go to child care. You know, a little thing like not having enough diapers for one day can make you not go to work. Not going to work can have you lose your job. Losing your job can have you lose your apartment. All done. So, is that one diaper necessarily going to be the difference? I don't know, but it could be. So Joanne decided to do something about it. She started a diaper bank. In the beginning, she stacked diapers in her living room and gave out 5,000 diapers a month in New Haven. 
Five years later, the diaper bank operates out of a donated warehouse and gives out 200,000 diapers a month to agencies in New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford. About 25% of those diapers are donated. Many times we do get um, letters saying that in lieu of gifts for my baby shower, I'm going to have a diaper drive. Volunteers from schools pitch in, and so do local businesses, according to Janet Alfano, the operations manager for the diaper bank. We love diaper drives because the community you know, gets involved and we, we meet a lot of wonderful people. Almost three quarters of the diapers are bought in bulk directly from a manufacturer because, like a food bank, the diaper bank can make dollars go further with mass purchasing power. But what about reusable cloth diapers? Wouldn't they be cheaper for struggling families? Joanne and Janet say those families often don't have their own washing machines, and most laundromats don't allow diaper washing. Lynn Hobson, the executive director of Head Start, says kids are suffering. We would see them come in with rashes on Monday. They wouldn't have them by the time they left us at the end of the week because we change them frequently. But to have a baby sitting in that, it's a horrible thing. You know, I would try to change her diaper as much as I could, mm -hmm. but it was so difficult because I was with my last three or four, no money in my pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, but once she started the program and they started giving me diapers, it was so much different. By federal law, the Head Start program must provide diapers to its kids, but there's no federal funding to pay for them. And we just could not afford it. And then Joanne founded the diaper bank, and it was like, whew, thank you. And she really did, almost single-handedly, help save us. If not for the diaper bank, what would you have done? I choose not to think about it, because I don't know what would we have done. The diaper bank now provides diapers to use here at Head Start and a pack each month for each child to take home. More than 60 other agencies in three of Connecticut's biggest cities also count on the diaper bank. Joanne is lobbying the state legislature and Congress to provide money so parents can buy their own. She says all of this has taught her an important lesson. It's told me that you can do something, that anybody can do something. If you get a group of people together who believe in something, you can change something. Changing things, one diaper at a time, in a way that is positively Connecticut. Baseball used to be known as America's pastime. Today, the game is nearing extinction in our inner cities. But with the help of Major League Baseball, a program is turning young people back to the game in Bridgeport. Eric Clemens tells us all about it in his Inside Out report. Inner cities in anywhere USA are generally full of playgrounds with young men pursuing their hoop dreams. Baseball, once called America's pastime, is almost non-existent here. But at Bridgeport's Seaside Park, the Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities, or RBI program started 20 years ago by Major League Baseball, is keeping the game on life support. Community involvement, volunteerism, and passion have acted as emergency medical personnel for many years. We're going to take you some places, you're going to meet people, we're going to introduce you to people in the community who have professions, and we're going to introduce you to people who maybe don't have professions, just hardworking people giving back to the community, which is what I expect from you when you get done and you're successful in life. Come on back, give something back. Messages like this are delivered constantly with baseball as the serving plate. Finish it, let's go, finish it. Let's go, boys. Finish it, don't slow up, finish it. All right here, fellas, everybody right here, come on, let's go. But because Bridgeport has no Major League Baseball affiliation, financing for the day-to-day -day operations is not provided. So raising money to keep things going is the job of its volunteer organizers and coaches. New leadership and new sponsors help lighten the load. In the inner city, you buy a glove, buy a aluminum bat, a pair of spikes, you're over allotment of money. But what Major League Baseball and the KPMG group that's uh, presenting this year is outstanding. It's just growing, and hopefully it keeps going. But you're already at full speed. You can take second base. 
About 60 kids total will be trying out for the RBI teams, with 18 each going on the junior and senior editions of the RBI ball clubs. The on-the-field goal is to reach the regional competition with the RBI World Series in Jupiter, Florida coming up in August. But the real aim of this program is to simply raise productive, solid citizens and young men. And that part is working. Today, over one million inner city kids take part in RBI baseball nationwide. Less than 200 have even been drafted to play professional. But the program gives many the polish they need to play in college or even catch the eyes of recruiters and scouts who normally don't even bother to look here for talent. These summer programs do help the kids to kind of get themselves noticed to more colleges because they do hear about these tournaments. Left, 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 left. College is expensive. Sports gives them a great opportunity to succeed and to get to that next level. The biggest thing I always stress to them is don't be afraid to fail, but on the fail factor, don't be afraid to overachieve. As long as you can push yourself, apply yourself, stay away from the trouble, you can definitely be successful. It's going to train you to be a better person, a better human being, and a better responsible adult. William Garay and son, William Jr., are witnesses. The gifts given in this program transcend baseball. They've been more family than, than anything else. They help me get into school, work with my teammates, work with my peers, develop leadership skills. The coaches have even been father figures to me. They even helped me out with raising my son at an early age. You think you're going to try to be a, a pro ball player one day? Yeah. What's your favorite position? Uh, shortstop. It is unknown whether we'll see any of these faces on a sports TV highlight show one day. But if they stick with Bridgeport's American Legion RBI program, they'll get a good chance to shine in the game of life. You can't do anything in life without school. Education is something that no one can ever take from you. Get it! Thanks to the volunteer organizers of the RBI program, these kids certainly are. The harder you work at something, the better you're going to get. Hard work is going to get you a reward in the long run. With your Inside Out report, I'm Eric Clements. The Etha Walker School is a girls' school in Simsbury, known for its equestrian tradition. Now the school is enhancing its reputation with its commitment to the environment. Christina DeFranco has more in our Treading Lightly report. No question, the Ethel Walker School's reputation is rich with riding. It's one of the top equestrian schools in the nation. But this private girls' school is now blazing the trail for high schools in Connecticut with its ambitious agenda for going green. The Ethel Walker School's commitment to the environment kicked into high gear in 2007 when the school sold 300 acres of conservation land to the town of Simsbury for preservation. That's when campus leaders started integrating green practices into all aspects of campus life and curricula. Thank you. Thank you. From the kitchen and the cafeteria to classes in econ, history, and even physics, it all relates to the environment. You have to figure out how much current is coming out of the solar panel. On a blustery March morning, teachers held classes high on the hill overlooking the school to drive home the point. We have a school. We have a school, we have roads, we have power lines, we have things that humans need. And then on this side we have what? Forest. The sun hits the glass which helps the heat stay inside of here. The water goes through the tubes and because of the sun's heat, when the water comes down through here because of gravity, it comes out warmer than what it started out. It's exhilarating. It's really an incredible place to be able to work with the kids and the adults, people who are really on board to make any change. Environmental science teachers Jill Harrington and Carol Clark Flanagan are part of the driving force behind this heightened consciousness. If you had a Rainforest logo mm -hmm. that the girls had designed and then you put that there, schools can go in and put their own name. Since founding the Green School Alliance chapter in Connecticut, they meet with leaders from other private schools on a regular basis. We can have these conversations and share ideas of what we've already done that works instead of having each school have to recreate the wheel. What's working in the cafeteria? New practices that include going trayless to cut back on water use, a push to eliminate all disposable dining ware, and adopting slow food practices for the menu. We use local produce whenever possible, and 
and we also use cage-free eggs. We have antibiotic and hormone-free milk and dairy products, as well as poultry. We purchase sustainable seafood whenever possible. The school recycles vegetable oil and composts its scraps. We will have at least two buckets of scraps every day, which we put into the garden for composting. So really, the teaching of the environment has gone way beyond the classroom. It has gone way beyond the classroom. We have the kids work on projects on campus where they are um, creating sustainable change here. One is studying whether or not we should stay with antibacterial soap on campus. The second group is working on looking for alternatives for composting our barn waste. We have about 70 horses on campus. The third group is looking into organic turf management. Pretty ambitious undertaking when you consider Walkers has about 200 acres of rolling hills and playing fields on this campus. The students in charge of this project, well, I call them the turf girls. There's actually been some legislation passed by our governor, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, yes, Jody Rell um, about a year and a half ago passed a law that requires um, elementary and middle schools to use um, organic fertilizer. So high schoolers aren't really there yet, but we want to sort of be that model that really influences high school to go completely organic. So. These projects are real world examples. They're calling people, calling people they don't know. They're meeting with our board of trustees and our um, senior administration. And they're learning how to go out and research something that they may be asked to research in the business world and then present their proposal. From the practical to the creative, students crafted these sculptures from two weeks of their own trash. Lugging that bag around for two weeks was not a fun thing by any means. Um, it was heavy. And I just was amazed that after two weeks I had a trash bag, you know, a huge trash bag filled with stuff. And this ticket represents my ticket out of being an unaware consumer. To make sure no one remains unaware of their impact on the environment, this team of seniors created a video that aired on YouTube as part of the Green Cup Challenge between 150 private schools. This was the sort of thing we felt would change behavior, not just showing people what they could do, giving them a reason to do it. Yeah, like people know how, but it puts like personal responsibility on the person watching. It says like it's in your hands. You have to actually apply what you know to saving the environment. No wonder it won the competition. For Treading Lightly, I'm Christina DeFranco. Finally, photographer Kevin Cool has gone fishing, capturing Connecticut on opening day along the Farmington and Housatonic Rivers. I'm Diane Smith. Join us again next week and be sure to check us out on the web at cptv.org, keywords, all things Connecticut. <laughs>
Funding for All Things Connecticut is made possible by our founding partner, People's United Bank. What know-how can do.